So this is my lecture on COVID. Um, I delivered this lecture uh, several occasions in 2020 and most of the content was built then. Um, this version probably runs through early 2021, but I am recording this now in June 2023. So I've made a few slight edits, um, but most of this content um, was kind of built whilst things were developing um, and will be somewhat dated. But I think that's also useful to look back and see what people were talking about and thinking about um, it in real time. I'm going to try and do two things in this lecture. The first is just to talk about what COVID is. There's some content here defining coronavirus and epidemics and pandemics and those sorts of concepts. And then we'll focus on the policy responses and think a bit about what various governments did and what the economic rationale for that was. So firstly, tracking COVID. Um, firstly, there's a very good video. Um, it's called The History and Economics of Global Pandemics by Steve Davies. There's a link below. Uh, I highly recommend that. And a lot of the content throughout this lecture comes from Steve's work. In terms of these basic terminology questions, um, an, epi an epidemic uh, is a rapidly spreading infectious disease. Um, it tends to initially have exponential growth rates, but will have some natural self-limitation. A pandemic is simply a global epidemic, or at least a geographical diffusion that extends beyond the initial outbreak. Recent pandemics include the 1918-19 Spanish flu. This originated in Kansas in America, not in Spain. Um, it killed over 50 million people worldwide, and there are some estimates that this potentially might be as high as 100 million. It had a 0.5 to 13% fatality rate. The Asian flu of 1957 to 58 claimed around 2 to 5 million lives. The 1968 to 69 Hong Kong flu claimed between 1 and 4 million lives. In 2009-2010 there was an outbreak of swine flu and this claimed about 0.5 million lives in total. So pandemics happen reasonably regularly um, and as we shall see there may be an argument that the rate at which they occur may in fact be increasing. To answer the question what's coronavirus so COVID-19 is an example of a coronavirus which is a respiratory tract infection they t occur in mammals such as swine flu or birds i.e bird flu so bird flu and swine flu are important um, things to track um, as of the time of writing, there were no current vaccines or treatment for the coronavirus. Um, infectiousness and severity tend to be inversely related when it comes to these types of disease. Uh, milder symptoms mean that there can be wider exposure. Um, so for example, the SARS virus had a 20 to 30% fatality rate, but because this fatality rate was so high, it didn't spread very far. Um, it also meant it was also relatively easy to track and isolate, which helped factors. Um, coronavirus looked bad from the beginning because it did bad on both of these metrics. Um, estimates were that it was twice as infectious as the flu and with a 0.4 to 1.6% fatality rate. So not only did it um, spread widely, but also it was particularly um, uh, dangerous for people that catch it. Um, when this was written, there was uh, unknown seasonality effects uh, warmer weather could reduce the spread, um, but then the optimistic case that the summer of 2020 would see a slowdown um, in the spread of COVID implied that there would then be a second wave in autumn, winter. Uh, in Steve's video, um, he suggested that COVID would be with us for 18 to 24 months. Um, and I think the point that he was making was that it would uh, uh, be a, a longer lasting issue um, than many people at the time were thinking or hoping. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that a pandemic occurred. Um, so this is a foreign affairs article published in 2005. It says over the past 300 years, 10 influenza pandemics have occurred among humans. The most recent, as we've seen, 1957 to 58 and 68 to 69. Several tons of thousands of Americans died in each one, and yet they were considered mild. Another foreign affairs article um, published in 2005 said that scientists have long forecast the appearance of an influenza virus capable of infecting 40% of the world's human population and killing unimaginable numbers. So people were talking about this back in 2005. And also in 2005, there was a lot of attention given to an avian flu that might migrate onto humans. 
indeed. Um, I remember being a graduate student at George Mason uh, where one of my professors, Tyler Karen, um, announced that he'd started a new blog project, this time on avian flu. April 13th, 2005, that blog launched um, with a graduate school friend of mine, Sylvia Dochia. Tyler said, it's odd to start a blog that you hope nobody reads, but that is what this is. They decided they would track what was happening with avian flu in anticipation of the potential for it to become a major global issue. Uh, the website still exists, um, so you can go online and you can see the avian flu website. Um, this is actually a screenshot of the final post from April 26, 2006. Avian flu didn't cause a global pandemic, as we know, and so the blog kind of ceased its purpose and they shut it down. But this just demonstrates that uh, people were paying attention to the potential for um, novel coronaviruses um, to create a global pandemic. The URL you can see there below. Uh, indeed, in his Economic Principles textbook, Tyler Karen used vaccine production um, as a specific example. Um, this is a direct quote from that textbook. If a good is vital for national security, but domestic producers have higher costs than foreign producers, it can make sense for the government to tax imports or subsidise the production of the domestic industry. It may make sense, for example, to support a domestic vaccine industry. In 1918, more than a quarter of the US population got sick with the flu and more than 500,000 died, sometimes within hours of being infected. The young were especially hard hit and as a result, life expectancy in the United States dropped by 10 years. No place in the world was safe. Between 2.5% and 5% of the entire world population died from the flu between 1918 and 1920. Producing flu vaccine requires an elaborate process in which robots inject hundreds of millions of eggs with flu viruses. In an ordinary year, there are a few problems with buying vaccine produced in another country, but if something like the 1918 flu swept the world again, it would be wise to have significant vaccine production capacity in the United States. So they were just using this as a standard textbook example um, of where government should be investing its uh, time and resources. Um, and I think it's no surprise that Karen and also his co-author Alex Tabarrok became very influential voices um, when coronavirus uh, started hitting the news. Another example to say that we shouldn't be surprised that a pandemic occurred is Hans Rosling book's Factfulness. In that book, he listed the five global risks we should worry about. Number one was a global pandemic. He wrote, serious experts on infectious diseases agree that a new nasty kind of flu is still the most dangerous threat to global health. An airborne disease like flu with the ability to spread very fast constitutes a greater threat to humanity than diseases like Ebola or HIV AIDS. Uh, Rosling anticipated that richer nations would do most to spread the disease, but their superior government policy and wealth would protect them from the consequences. So his concern was for the global poor that would lack the resources to intervene rapidly once the disease spread to him. Maybe with hindsight, it seems a bit too optimistic um, about the capabilities of richer nations um, to be able to protect people from uh, the pandemic itself. But just note that this book was published in 2018, 2019. It came into print. Um, and so just a couple of years before um, before COVID, uh, we can see um, very serious books talking about major global risks and identifying a global pandemic as number one. Uh, finally, some other examples. 2017, the Pentagon produced a report uh, on responding to an influenza pandemic. Um, to quote that report, the most likely and significant threat is a novel respiratory disease, particularly a novel influenza disease. Competition for and scarcity of resources would include non-pharmaceutical MCM, such as ventilators, medical equipment, logistical support. This will have a significant impact on the availability of the global work workforce. So we could see people um, coming up with plans to deal with um, the consequences of a pandemic um, as of 2017. Uh, in terms of the economic impact of pandemics prior to COVID, um, this was a paper that was published um, in uh, 2020, March 2020. Um, it says that mortality and the economic contraction during the 1918-1920 influenza pandemic um, provides some plausible upper bounds for the outcomes under coronavirus. Um, for 43 countries, 
flu-related deaths from 1918 to 20 um, were 39 million, which was 2% of, of world population, um, implying 150 million deaths when applied to the current, i.e. 2020 population. Regressions with annual information on flu deaths and war deaths imply flu-generated economic declines for GDP and consumption in the typical country of 6 and 8% respectively. There is some evidence that higher flu deaths rate decreased realised real returns on stocks and especially on short-term government bills. So that uh, demonstrates where some of that negative economic impact will be, but also gives some upper bounds on what would happen um, to death tolls and also to GDP. One thing that I found interesting during the COVID pandemic was it was not always obvious uh, which voices to listen to to try to understand what was happening. Uh, one thing I noticed was the importance of super forecasting. So the Good Judgment Project brings together various super forecasters. Um, and I found this quite useful during the pandemic. Um, March 25th, 2020, um, there was a 37% chance that the global death toll would be between 80,000 and 800,000 and a 48% chance that it would be between 800,000 and 8 million. As of April 15th, 2020, those odds jumped dramatically. Um, there was a 70% chance it would be between 800,000 and less than 8 million uh, and a 20% chance that it would be between 8 and 80 million. So just looking at those super forecasting um, projections, I found quite useful um, because they were very quick to change based on new information. Going back to Steve Davies' lecture again, um, he points out some of the key factors that affect the spread. One is the medical features of the pathogen. So intensive livestock farming is a perfect breeding ground for novel pathogens um, or wet markets, which tend to happen. Um, for example, the trading of bats and pangolins in wet markets but also the social and economic structure of the world. So it's not just the scientific, biological, epidemiological um, features of the pathogen itself. It's also the social arrangements and economic arrangements that govern economic activity. Globally connected cities are initial focal points. Um, so whether in terms of pilgrimage or as commercial hubs, uh, people tend to um, co co find themselves uh, in cities. Um, Pandemics also follow trade routes, so we can look at the traditional land and maritime trade routes um, and in a modern economy, this will also be um, air travel. The big mistake historically is that when there is some kind of a pandemic or epidemic situation, people's instinct is to flee the cities, but in doing so they carry the disease. Um, and it's quite interesting how we did see examples of this in 2020 um, when people were anticipating lockdowns. You'd have the city, which is where um, disease would typically spread, and then people would vacate the city and carry it with them. Uh, the Black Death um, occurred as a consequence of the disease being carried from city to countryside. That was a critical mechanism um, that meant that the disease spreaded. To come up with a more recent um, example of this type of situation, think about the Italy travel ban being leaked. Um, once people knew that there was going to be an impending travel ban, they expedited um, their decisions to try to move. Um, and in doing so, that probably caused uh, a massive increase in the spread of the disease. Steve points out that decisions about how to alter that social and economic structure will determine the impact on the economy. So there's no guaranteed impact um, on the economy. The impact is a function of how we decide to alter the social and economic structure. Um, that's something that's down to policymakers' influence. Another important thing to recognise is that typically the impact, in particular the long-term impact, um, will accelerate and intensify pre-existing trends. And so rather than think that pandemics are going to cause a completely new reality, um, even though the kind of the world after the pandemic might be very different from the world before, it will typically accelerate and intensify existing trends. And therefore, we have some indications about what that future would look like. So now let's turn our attention to some policy responses. Firstly, I want to say that major natural disasters aren't inevitably macroeconomic disasters. Um, my favourite example for this is in April 2011, 
Japan suffered the fourth most powerful earthquake since 1900. The resulting tsunami reached six miles inland. There was extensive damage to infrastructure across the northeast of the country. Three nuclear reactors at the Fukushima power plant went into meltdown. 10% of households in the entire country went without electricity and all 50 of the country's nuclear reactors were out of use. On paper, this is a significant negative shock and it's hard to imagine how an economy and society is going to continue um, given such a bad situation. However, the Q1 GDP growth rate contracted by 3.7%, but the earthquake only struck in the last month of that quarter. So we can't attribute that negative growth rate entirely um, to the earthquake. And uh, indeed, by the third quarter, Japan was out of recession and growing at 6% per annum. Um, if economic macroeconomic policy um, is effective, then we can have significant natural resource shocks to an economy um, and not see that turn into a major recession, major depression, major turmoil. Uh, another example of this is the Asian flu pandemic of 1957. Um, now, this killed between 70 and 100,000 people in the United States. It wasn't as infectious or severe as COVID-19. Um, and this is showing real GDP in the United States during this period. What you'll notice is that in the end of 1957, GDP was negative 4%. In fact, in the first quarter of 1958, GDP was minus 10%, which was the biggest decline post-World War II, and even bigger than the 2008 financial crisis. However, by the third and fourth quarter of 1958, GDP was back up to almost 10%. In fact, for the whole of the 1958 period, GDP fell by less than 1%. Many sources don't even cite the pandemic as one of the causes of the recession. It had largely seemed to have been forgotten about. I think when COVID first struck, some people were looking at this as an example of how there is a potential for a very quick rebound and hopefully there would be no long lasting uh, impact of that in the economic data. If we look at some specific figures from the time, um, so this is from May 2020. These were the Morgan Stanley forecasts. They forecast a 5.1% fall in global GDP in 2020 and then a 5.6% rebound in 2021. Um, so this is quite a dramatic change from what people were expecting before. Um, if we look at some Bank of England growth, uh, forecasts, um, they were forecasting 1.4% growth in 2020 and 1.6% growth in 2021. Um, so dramatic kind of greater magnitudes um, than what people were expecting before. But the important thing to notice from this chart uh, is the fact that the fall in 2020 was eclipsed by an even bigger rebound in 2021. Now, Morgan Stanley provided the base case in blue, a bear case and a bull case. Um, so you can see those three different scenarios that they were trying to demonstrate what the impact might be. All of them, though, represent a V-shaped recovery. They all actually ended up with having GDP growth uh, higher than it was coming into the uh, into the pandemic. Um, I would just want to point out that I would not call this scenario analysis. This is sensitivity analysis. So when you take a forecast um, and then make subtle variations to a single frame, then you're not engaged in what I would call proper scenarios, which is where you're creating multiple divergent frames. Um, but this is something that we saw in quite common across various different publications during COVID was looking at a range of forecasts and then tweaking them just to try and see what the impact was. The fact that um, what actually ended up happening doesn't resemble either of the, those three cases or even within the range of these three cases um, may indicate um, that there's something wrong with that methodology. As I said, though Morgan Stanley were thinking that in all three different cases, there would be a V-shaped recovery. And this is a nice graphic just to demonstrate some different types of recovery. Um, in a V-shaped recovery, the economy recovers. Um, some activity is uh, permanently lost, but the economy does get back up onto the previous trend path that it was in. 
A U-shaped recovery is quite similar to a V-shape. It just means that the recovery back to the trend path takes a longer amount of time. So if we can see in terms of the time difference for a V-shape versus a U-shape, um, a U-shape takes much longer, but we still end up um, where we would have been previously. Uh, a so-called swoosh-shaped recovery um, is when the recovery um, is longer than a V-shape, but slower than a U-shape. It's not obvious to me that this is a dramatically different, um, but it's almost as though the recovery kind of asymptotically um, gets back to where we uh, where we were. If we have highly sophisticated policymakers, um, this might be a kind of considered to be a softer landing. Um, because there may be a difficulty with policymakers just to kind of withdraw the stimulus that might be required for the recovery in order to get back to that trend path. The swoosh shape is a little bit more of a kind of a, a soft landing. A Z-shaped recovery is when you overshoot um, and then have to kind of bring the economy back down to the level it would have been before. Um, a W-shaped recovery is kind of a stuttering start. Um, it's where there is a recovery, but it's insignificant. So you need multiple kind of attempts to try to get back to that path. And then in an L-shaped recovery, this is where the economy never fully recovers. Um, and you can see that the uh, growth that occurs never gets us back up to that previous uh, trend line. Um, my criticism of these charts um, is that remarkably five of the six different possible outcomes um, actually get us back to the pre-crisis trend path. Um, so it's only the L-shape where we don't get back. Um, and even still, um, this L shape gets us back to our previous growth rate. So what we don't see here is any sort of a recovery. Um, if I just annotate this here, if this is what the economy was doing pre-COVID, uh, what we don't see is any of these examples where um, we just kind of end up um, <clears throat> with lower growth. Um, maybe even we have uh, future growth, but it's never the same growth rate as it was previously. Another big problem, and this is something that David Beckworth pointed out, um, is that all of these recoveries, and you can see um, the ones that I'm labeling here, um, have instances where we have quite dramatic increases in growth. Um, David Beckworth has pointed out that um, for, in order for this to happen, it implies that there's so much stimulus in the economy that we'd almost certainly be above our 2% inflation target, and monetary authorities are not supposed to allow that to happen. So it might be optimistic to assume that we might have one of these recoveries, given that central bank's job is to prevent such rapid growth taking place. Um, as we've seen, we have had quite a quick recovery, and that has been because central banks have um, either allowed or accidentally delivered um, significant amounts of inflation. This slide just covers um, what I think are the kind of three most important types of recovery to think about. The V is the quick rebound. Um, so this is where consumers that have delayed their spending um, just all come out and start spending again. Um, we can imagine that whilst we're kind of um, in the pandemic phase, people are unable to spend. We have this pent up demand. Um, and then once that gets unleashed, we have a very strong recovery. Um, it may be the case that more work from home reduces commuting times. It may even impact productivity and then mean that we have a faster growth rate as a consequence. Higher savings are concentrated with high earners and retirees who have low marginal propensities to consume. Um, in this scenario, there's probably a fall in asset prices, especially if they're all overvalued um, and there'll therefore be a transfer of wealth from savers to debtors. Much of that debt, though, possibly won't be repaid. The key issue in a V recovery um, is whether or not work from home and furlough schemes have helped to keep incomes stable enough. Um, question then is whether or not the increases in savings that get accumulated turns into windfall spending once the economy reopens or a buffer against future uncertainties. So the big open question is just whether or not people kind of have a permanent reduction in their spending because they're more concerned about economic uncertainty or whether about once the economy opens, people get spending again. The L-shaped recovery is what I would call the new normal. Um, so think this through a little bit. This is where government relief measures have some limited impact. Maybe there's too many gaps for the Treasury to cover. Fiscal policy is just incapable of ensuring that people have the money in the pocket that they need to be able to maintain their spending and economic activity. And this might be where it takes too long to emerge from lockdown. Um, it could also lock into a prevailing secular slowdown. So we've 
already seen pre-COVID reductions in growth rates in many countries. We can imagine zombie firms characterized the previous recovery. Um, so when we came out of the global financial crisis, there was a claim that many companies that should have been bankrupt and freed up the resources for others were kind of kept left alive by artificially low interest rates and just carried on like zombie firms. And so this ties into a new normal recovery here. Um, the concern is that lots of the economy um, lacked resilience build it leading into COVID as a consequence of those zombie firms. Also, recessions tend to exo expose existing problems. So the extent to which there are existing problems in the global economy, these get um, exposed. And also that hysteresis effects are large. So this is where unemployment generates increased longevity of unemployment. Um, it might be the case that if there's a spike in unemployment over a couple of months, then the economy can adjust quite quickly. But if people are unemployed for a significant period of time, then their skills will deteriorate and it might become increasingly harder to find work. So a hysteresis effect is where a short term problem becomes a long term one. The third main type of recovery, I think, is the W1. So this is what I'd call the stuttered restart. Um, so this could coincide with a second wave to the pandemic. So when you have multiple waves of the pandemic, that will probably mean that we have multiple impacts on economic activity. Um, as of 2020, where did that look like? It could either be from China, the US or Western Europe, or it could be the first wave from other parts of the world. In such a case, there's a need to act quite quickly and to be more coordinated. Um, we know that low middle income countries have weak health care and can't enforce social distancing, but they do have younger demographics, which works in their favour. Remember that Hans Rosling feared influenza pandemics not because of the impact on rich countries, but on the global poor. So that stuttered restart has concerns about how this felt, plays out through the, the global economy as a whole. 20% uh, of UK expert exports are to low middle income countries. And so a global pandemic is going to have a global impact on economic activity. I think we'll also start to increasingly hear about the K economy or the K recovery. Um, so this is where there's a distinction between how various groups within the economy is dealing with things. So rather than thinking about everybody as one type of category, um, this is a split. Some firms have access to credit. They have online capabilities. Um, global pandemic may actually help them. Some consumers are relatively affluent. They're also able to work from home. A global pandemic may mean their living standards and quality of life actually improves. By contrast, some firms are SMEs, which have very much less access to credit. Um, they may be brick and mortar companies where it's simply impossible for them to be able to um, shift into online capabilities. Some consumers lack savings to be able to fall back on. Um, some consumers are service or essential workers where they don't have the ability to work from home even if they wanted to. So the K recovery is looking at the kind of inequality of different fundamental groups within the economy and saying some people may benefit, some people will suffer much more. Uh, some interesting data here, 9% uh, of workers in the top fifth of the wage distribution lost their jobs by April 2021. 37% of workers in the bottom fifth of the wage distribution lost their jobs by April 2021. So there's a massive disjoint here uh, in terms of whether or not you're in the top group or the bottom group. Another important point to recognise is that annual growth rates probably won't reveal the full picture. Um, so Simon Wren Lewis did some, um, did some analysis of a uh, hypothetical pandemic um, in the work that they did. Um, they found that GDP would fall by 30% in the quarter in which the pandemic occurred. There was a similar fall in consumption, um, but GDP for the year as a whole fell by just 6%. So if we're looking at annual growth rates, that will obviously mask the severity of what's happening um, within those years. Um, and this is a nice kind of number to bear in mind that we could have a 6% negative hit to GDP, um, but for specific quarters, um, we can have uh, changes by as much as 30%. This was one of the most powerful charts of the pandemic. Uh, March 27th, 2020, uh, we saw a massive spike in the number of jobless claims in the US. This was a 50-year high, um, such a large number that the New York Times run this famous front page um, where they had to actually um, 
use the y-axis up into the fold. The St. Louis Fed back of the envelope estimates of the unemployment rate at the end of the second quarter of 2020 were between 10 and 40%. Um, and that just demonstrates just how kind of much of a historically significant shock this was to the economy. As of April 2020, the IMF produced some global growth projections. Um, they projected that there would be a 6% uh, hit to advanced economies growth in 2020. Um, so remember that this obviously uh, glosses over um, the magnitude within any individual quarter. Um, but they were estimating that the 2020 growth for the US economy would be minus 5.9% and for the world as a whole, it would be minus 3%. Also notice, though, the quite strong rebound in 2021. So they thought that global GDP would fall by 3% in 2020, but grow by 6% in 2021. Um, there'd be a minus 6% shock in 2020 for advanced economies, but plus 4.5% growth in 21. As it says here, the global economy is projected to contract sharply, which is much worse than during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Their baseline scenario, which is that the pandemic fades in the second half of 2020 and containment efforts can be gradually unwound, um, will cause 5.8% growth in 2021 as economic activity normalises. This is showing some real GDP growth changes in 2020 across various countries. Uh, the euro area contracted by 6.6%. Um, the impact was worse in the UK, which was almost minus 10%. Um, not quite as bad as in France, minus 8%. Um, and Germany came off best with minus 4.9% growth. One key factor here is that countries with large service sectors, especially things like tourism, were the most likely to be hit. Also note though, cross-country comparisons can be misleading. So when we're looking at the UK, France, Italy versus Spain, um, this is using data from the IMF, from the European Commission and from the OECD. So when we're looking at those figures, um, these countries do measure the public sector output in slightly different ways. So Julian Jessup has warned that international comparisons of GDP aren't always straightforward and we should be a little bit careful about making these comparisons between different countries. This is showing changes in employment, um, which is obviously compiled in a different way. So some economists might say that this is a better guide to make country by country comparisons. Others would say it's even worse. Um, but you can see here that the UK did better than some of those other countries when it comes to changes in employment. Um, they did worse when it comes to changes in GDP growth. Just to summarise some of these key economic factors, um, economic forecasts were originally quite optimistic about the strength of a potential recovery. As the coronavirus spread and mutated, those early hopes were shown to have been too optimistic. Good progress on vaccine deployment provided some optimism in early 2021, but there were still concerns about the scale of the rollout. In terms of the UK fiscal policy response to coronavirus, um, the UK government committed to replacing 80% of the wages of any worker placed on furlough. So this was quite a remarkable um, scheme where the government said that we would cover 80% of the salary of any workers placed on furlough. This was intended to prevent people being made unemployed and to share the costs of those um, with the companies. It involved £330 billion worth of loan guarantees. Um, the total package of additional spending was estimated to, con to cost more than 50 billion originally, um, which was around 2.3% of GDP. This was more than the dedicated UK fiscal response to the global financial crisis, um, which was 0.6% of GDP in 08 09 and 1.5% of GDP in 09 10, so significantly more uh, government spending. Now, it's very hard to estimate the cost of some of these activities. The fiscal multiplier is not really relevant here. So the typical case for government spending in some kind of a crisis situation is because if government increases its spending, this can kickstart and prompt private sector spending. And the relationship between uh, what the government is doing in terms of spending and the impact on the economy is known as the multiplier. But the reason why the government is stepping up here is not because they're trying to stimulate economic activity per se. A lot of this support with transfer payments rather than actual costs. 
I think the best way to think through the policy response is with this equation. So this is saying that the growth rate of the money supply plus changes in people's desire to spend money is equal to the combined growth rate of inflation and real GDP growth. Now, when we think about recessions, historically, a business cycle was pretty much always down to supply side factors, things such as weather or disease. If we take a very standard growth model and say the potential output is a function of labor, of capital and the combination of labor and capital or technology, um, we can think of the Black Death, for example, which was where labor force dramatically fell. But that isn't the situation with the pandemic. I don't think it's the case that we can predominantly see this as a negative supply shock in terms of so many people dying. There's no real change in the capacity of the economy to be able to deliver. The labour force was largely undamaged um, and physical assets typically remained. So it's not necessarily the case that all recessions have to be driven by the supply side. It can be the case and the classic example of a recession comes from the demand side instead. This is where a fall in confidence causes people to stop spending money. So V contracts. And then the response by policymakers is typically for monetary policy to attempt to offset that fall in people's confidence by reducing interest rates to try to increase spending. It might be that monetary policy becomes ineffective and interest rates are so low they can't be cut any further. And that's typically the example where fiscal policy comes in and the government attempts to spend the money that needs to get spent to kickstart things and get the economy out of recession. So if historically we see business cycles driven by real factors or supply side factors, it can be tempting to think that the COVID pandemic was a real business cycle driven by real factors because it was negatively impacting the factors of production. But we can also think about whether or not it ties into a demand side recession where people's decisions to spend money is affecting whether or not the economy is growing or contracting. In the COVID pandemic, the recession is a very interesting one because it seems to me as though there was a reduction in spending taking place, not because the public didn't want to spend, but because the government was saying that you're not allowed to spend. The reduction in economic activity, i.e. a recession, was exactly what we wanted and needed at the time in order to try to reduce the spread of COVID. We made a decision that we were prioritising health factors rather than economic factors. Now, this suggests that the um, recovery should be relatively strong because if the problem with a classic recession is trying to get reluctant people to spend and therefore potentially the role for government to spend on their behalf, if the reason why people aren't spending is just because they're not allowed to, then we don't need to boost spending to come out of the recession. We just need to ease lockdowns. Key question, though, is whether or not those assets will still be there. We know that SMEs are particularly vulnerable because of a lack of resources and existing institutional support mechanisms. So the real question was whether or not underlying productivity gets damaged whilst those lockdowns are in place. In theory, if you have a quick lockdown to be able to try to keep track of the disease and make progress on our health um, outcomes and expectations, um, then it's just a question of whether or not we can enter that lockdown period without destroying the kind of the economic transactions, uh, the supply chains and things um, that we need. Uh, this is what we saw with the kind of the mothballing. So these were some of the images that I found quite powerful. Um, this was March 21st, 2020, and we saw all of these um, aeroplanes being grounded. Um, we know that temporarily, if the uh, lockdown periods are quite short and people can, you know, are authorised to start travelling again, um, then we would expect quite quick growth to recover with not much need for monetary or fiscal policy responses. The key question, though, is for the amount of time in which we do mothball, whether or not the capital goods start to decay, whether the fairly complex interrelation um, of capital goods breaks down such that when we do want to kickstart the economy, we've lost some of the power um, of what meant that economy be productive in the first place. Now, in terms of the implications for inflation, again, I think this equation helps us. Initially, I thought that this was a standard negative supply shock. So I think like most people, I interpreted natural disaster, such as a pandemic, as predominantly affecting 
um, the y variable here and negatively impacting potential growth rate. Just notice though that if m and v are stable um, and if we do have a negative contraction in y that implies that p must rise. So if m plus v is stable and there's a fall in the potential growth rate of the economy that implies that there must be inflation and during that period um, it seems as though that if central banks allowed inflation to go above target temporarily as a consequence of that negative real shock, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing and inflation didn't seem to be a problem. Central banks should also make sure they offset any fall in confidence with expansionary monetary policy. So to the extent to which greater economic uncertainty caused people to reduce their spending, there's scope for governments to try to offset that through extra money. In this situation, the, the fiscal multiplier, the relationship between government spending and impact on the wider economy is not the critical driver. So I say here that the fiscal stimuli is probably going to be ineffective and monetary policy would be much more effective. But there's clearly a moral case for a fiscal policy response. And so government should increase spending, but not because the priority is to try to have the most meaningful impact on economic activity. The fact that inflation was quite low during 2020 made me reassess this. It made me realise that this isn't really a negative supply shock, this is actually a negative demand shock. This is a state mandated reduction in spending. In this, if we see um, M plus V fall, so if this left hand side um, that we can see all of this here is our total spending in the economy. If the government is telling us to stop spending because of things like lockdown, then that's going to put downwards pressure on inflation. As restrictions ease, high inflation would be a sign of overly expansionary monetary policy. So if the government is trying to respond to the crisis by increasing the money supply, by cutting interest rates and trying to boost economic activity, either through um, monetary policy or through fiscal policy, then that would put upward pressure on inflation and that could become a future problem. It's also worth pointing out that if damage to supply chains has occurred during this period, then that would put a negative uh, shock to the productive capacity of the economy. Um, and if Y falls, that would also create some inflationary pressure. What I've tried to explain in this slide is just the fact that the knee jerk assumption that the COVID pandemic is predominantly a supply side shock should have led to increases in inflation. The fact that we actually saw inflation quite low, I think, demonstrates that it was predominantly a demand shock. The recovery, if it's going to be quick, uh, therefore poses a real challenge to policymakers for them to be able to withdraw the demand that they've been injecting before it becomes too high in terms of inflation. I also like this article by Sam Bowman and Sam Dimitriou. Um, talking about why this was not a normal recession. Uh, in a normal recession, we are realising that there's a miscoordination between demand and supply, and therefore the economic process requires us to move resources from the companies that are low value and low productivity to the companies that are creating goods and services that people want, and for that recalculation process to take place. With COVID, we didn't learn that some businesses are successful and some are failing. We didn't need a redistribution of assets from the unprofitable enterprises to the profitable ones. This was an economy-wide system. This was where businesses across all sectors were being mandated to reduce their activity. In fact, a reduction in economic activity was exactly what we wanted so that we could deal with the health emergency. As they argue, policy should be directed towards mothballing such that they can operate once the economy opens up again. Trying to preserve the capital structure as best as possible should be the policy goal. Things like maintaining company revenues through things like credit notes, keeping people on payroll, such as furloughing staff. You're attempting essentially to try to freeze the economy, to ride out the health crisis, and then hope that when the economy thaws, as much of that context exists as possible. As mentioned before, SMEs were particularly vulnerable due to a lack of resources and existing institutional support mechanisms and warranted probably significant attention to try to work out creative ways in which they can be helped. I think it is clear though, and this was a paper from March 2020 that reduced economic activity saved lives. 
In this economic model, people's decision to cut back on consumption and work reduces the severity of the epidemic. We can also look at some insight from past pandemics on policy responses. Um, in this 2006 paper published by the, UK, the uh, Treasury of Australia, um, the paper found that confidence effects and the large short-term withdrawal of labour are the dominant mechanisms through which a pandemic adversely affects the economy. So how do we deal with confidence shocks? It's making sure that there's sufficient demand being injected by monetary policy and fiscal policy to offset that fall in confidence. How do we deal with the short-term withdrawal of labour? It's trying to make sure that companies aren't making long-term decisions because of short-term necessity. The macroeconomic policy implications flow naturally from these potential economic effects, policies that restore confidence in consumption, support business in the short term and promote a quick return to work are likely to be most effective in offsetting the adverse economic consequences of a pandemic. Um, June 2020, the Bank of England uh, minutes of their MPC meeting said tentative evidence that the strongest recoveries had been in those economies that had eased lockdown restrictions earlier than others. But having said this, it's also important to point out that it may be the case that the countries that ease lockdown restricts earlier are the countries that are further ahead, ahead in their experience of the pandemic. Um, so it's not clear whether the strongest recoveries follow those who ease relatively earlier and whether or not this should mean that countries decide to ease before they otherwise would do so. This slide attempts to summarise the lockdown debate, which is obviously a uh, controversial one. I think the main reasons in favour of lockdowns are that you reduce illness and death from COVID, you protect the health service capacity for the urgent non-COVID issues, uh, you reduce other communicable diseases, such as the flu. You have a consequence of reducing flu deaths. You have fewer deaths from road accidents, pollution and things like this. And you probably have a stronger economic recovery in the longer term. Main reasons against lockdown is the collapse in economic activity and associated livelihoods. The increase in public and private debt. The fact you have reduced support for non-urgent, non-COVID related issues, such as things like cancer detection. The damage caused to mental health and well-being. The impact on education, particularly for young people, those two issues can combine. And the damage to civil liberties. When I updated this, there was a discussion about the UK going into a third lockdown. And that seemed to be, I think, a fairly straightforward case. Um, when it came to the third lockdown, the easier transmission of the new variant increased the threat to health service capacity. The arrival of new vaccines meant that there was more certainty over the duration. And the fact that people were adapting behaviour to make lockdowns less economically costly meant that the argument in favour of lockdown three, I think, was quite strong. But just note that if those conditions didn't apply, if the new variant was less transmissible, um, if there were no vaccines on the horizon such that this was not necessarily going to be a short-term um, effect, um, if people's behaviour was differently such that the lockdowns had less impact, um, then the argument would be different. What are some key factors in the impact of COVID on the economy? This is taken from an article by Julian Jessup. Uh, he points out the key factors are demographics, so average age, underlying health issues, household types, whether or not there's mixing of households, for example, population density, whether people live closely to each other. So all of those things we can think of as demographic factors. Uh, people's behavioural response. So whether people wear face masks, their compliance with the rules, whether the culture is to do as you're told or to try to break those rules can be a key factor. The economic structure. So the dependency on various services, the most important services being tourism, and hospitality is going to have a big impact. The quality of government response does have an impact. So the availability of PPE, uh, things like track and trace, the vaccine development, having clear and consistent messaging to the public can help. Also the stringency of government response. So the use of lockdowns and tiered systems, border control can have an impact as well. We also need to bear in mind data differences so the different measures that we have of public sector output uh, 
might mean that if we're making comparisons between different countries, we're actually picking up on differences in the way that data is measured rather than different impacts. It's tempting to kind of attribute all of the success and failure to policy choices. And this is an important slide just to demonstrate that different countries take on different starting positions. Um, but the way in which government policymakers respond to the crisis is an important factor in how well that country will fare. If we wanted to summarise very quickly what was driving deaths in the UK, there's probably the three Ds, delay, demographics and diet. One point I'd like to make is that there have been some creative mechanisms for public funding. And I think one hopefully important thing that we learn from the COVID pandemic is that we've learned some ways in which we can generate increases uh, in genuine innovation. Um, it can be hard to target investment for creative breakthroughs. And the common solution to this is grants. For example, the European Commission allocated 164 million euros for SMEs that identified some innovative solutions. The alternative to grants, though, is prizes. And it's really interesting to see the increased scope of prizes during COVID. Tyler Cowen, who I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, announced $1 million for innovations in promoting social distancing, finding an effective treatment, and for written analyses of the virus. The main idea here is that we want companies to develop vaccines and give them away rather than earn profit through monopoly pricing. One way to achieve this is what's known as advanced market commitments. In 2007, several governments and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation committed $1.5 billion to a prize fund. Pharmaceutical companies bid for 10-year contracts to create and produce a vaccine that could be sold for no higher than $3.50 per dose. Ultimately, three vaccines were developed and are now available for just $2 per dose. So if you're going to have the government being a major buyer of various types of medical procedure, um, one argument is to say that they should make an advanced commitment to say that if that product exists, then they'll pay a certain price in order to achieve it. This can create much more certainty when people are trying to develop those products. And again, it changes the business model rather than companies speculating on how much money they could make if they have a patent over what they end up with. You're saying that if you be able to create something, we'll give you in advance um, the amount of money that we'd pay in that market commitment. Um, those uh, vaccines that were developed as of 2007 um, ended up being administered to over 150 million children. So that advanced market commitment, I think, serves as an interesting model that we did see people looking at when it came to COVID. Uh, ultimately, an estimated 700,000 lives had been saved. One um, application of this basic sentiment is to go big on vaccines. Alex Tabarrok, um, who we mentioned previously, um, was very vocal on this throughout the pandemic. And I think the emerging evidence suggests that a lot of what he was saying um, was entirely sensible. Um, he said the world spent on the order of $20 billion or so on vaccines and got a return in the trillions. It was hard to get governments to spend billions on vaccines despite massive benefit to cost ratios, yet global spending on fiscal support was $14 trillion. Even now, there is more to be done to vaccinate the world quickly, but still we hesitate. So it's really interesting to see there's probably fewer uh, bigger economic impacts um, than vaccines, especially um, recently. Uh, and yet the difficulty in being able to get commitments, whether it's advanced market commitments or direct subsidies, whether it's through prizes or through grants, uh, demonstrates that we've still got some distance to go in terms of improving our policy responses and our policy approaches to these issues. Just to bring this to a close, I think the simple message to conclude with is to be prepared. So going back to Steve Davies, he says, pandemics are a regular feature of the modern world. Pandemics are increasing. Uh, we have more intensive farming than we used to. Increased demand for exotic meats. There's also pressure on wildlife habitats. The overuse of antibiotics means that many scientists have been warning for some time about a reduction in our resilience. If we reduce the global integration that make pandemics a modern problem, then living standards would be even lower. So the solution to this isn't to turn our back, 
on the trends that have brought the world closer together. It's to recognize that one of the downsides of bringing the world closer together is that pandemics become a more regular feature. Uh, we have become used to the flu, which can cut global GDP by about 0.7% in a year. But what we really need to be concerned about is whether or not the COVID it was just a starter, whether or not that was something that was testing our facilities. And the next pandemic is even worse. Imagine if the next pandemic is bacterial. Imagine if it is resistant to antibiotics. In such cases, the consequences would be significantly more dire. And we may look back to COVID as being a helpful early warning system to test out whether or not we're ready. Steve says, at least if that happens, we have had some practice at ramping up hospital capacities, at wearing masks, at social distancing, and as last resorts, going into lockdowns. I'll leave it as an open question about whether or not we passed the test that COVID had and what else we could be doing to ensure we have more resilience for the next pandemic, which will happen.